I think opinions are great. That's how we generate new ideas, theories, hypotheses, you name it. But in fairness, know something about the topic, not just what others have said before you go and slam it. Hey, how's it going? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, and you are listening to episode 626 with Dr. Jamie Seabrook. And of course, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, and a guy who really just loves martial arts. I love training. I love learning. I love talking about martial arts, hence this show. If you're new to the show, you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out everything that we've got going on with the show. Transcripts, links, and photos, and videos, and all that good stuff. You can sign up for our newsletter while you're over there and stay up on all the stuff that we do at Whistlekick. If you want the even easier way to stay up on what we do at Whistlekick, you go to whistlekick.com. Nice and easy. You're going to see all the things that we're involved in. It's a long list. That's why I don't name the list. There's so much stuff going on, and we're adding new things all the time. We do not sleep. Well, it's not true. We do sleep, but probably not as much as we should. Now, one of the things you're going to find over at whistlekick.com is our store, and that's one of the ways that we cover our bills because, yeah, there are bills in putting this together. And if you use the code PODCAST15, it saves you 15%. It helps us know that the show leads to sales because if the show didn't make us any money at all, it would be a little bit harder to justify. You know, just just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind next time you're, you're thinking about buying something. So, you know, just, I'm not saying you have to buy something from us, but I'm saying that if you like the show, you should probably check out what we have to offer once in a while and see if there's anything over there you can get from us. Okay. We've got two shows for you each and every week, all because we're trying to connect and educate and entertain you, the traditional martial artist. That's why we do all the things that we do. And if you want to support us, we've got a few things that you can do. There's a long list, but I'm going to give you a few. I mentioned you could buy something at whistlekick.com. You can go ahead and do that. You could also tell a friend about the show. And the best thing you can do, if there's an episode that you really enjoy, think of one person that may not know about the show and send them that episode. Send them a link. Send it from your phone. Send it from you know, the website, whatever works. And tell them, I want you to listen to this episode. And here's why I want you to listen to this episode. Give them a reason. Give them some context. And they'll check it out. And hopefully they stick around. And then we gain a listener. And then you two get something you can talk about. Everybody wins. Now, here's the third thing. You could go to whistlekickprograms.com, check out the various complementary martial arts training programs. We don't tell you how to do goju. We don't tell you how to do taekwondo. We don't teach you how to do this form or that form. We don't tell you how to spar. But what we do have is universal style agnostic training protocols. You want to get faster? We have a program for that. Would you like to get stronger? We have a training protocol for that. Do you want to become the best conditioned martial artist you've ever been? We have a training protocol for that. And we're adding more on all the time. There are a couple more that are in development right now. So check those out. They are far less expensive than you think they should be. We probably should raise the prices, but I don't like to do that. So we haven't done it because, well, we haven't. So go grab them. Check them out. Lifetime access. Oh, and of course, we've got Patreon, but that's four. So I'm not going to mention that. Ha. I will talk about today's episode. Dr. Jamie Seabrook came on. We had an awesome conversation. We talked about, well, I feel like these intros get repetitive because when I talk to the guests, it's not what we talk about. It's how they talk about it that makes it exciting and fun and different and worth checking out. Because yeah, we're talking about martial arts. The the subject matter that we start from is always the same, but because the person is different, the conversation is different. I'm the same. I'm the same person but the person I'm talking to is not. And that leads to some good stuff. And today's conversation was one of those. I had a good time. You're going to have a good time. So instead of finding more to say, I'm just going to shut up and you're going to get to hear this great conversation. Dr. Seabrook, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Well, you know, here we are. We're on a martial arts show. We are martial artists. We're going to talk about martial artists. There is nothing more obvious and I I think appropriate than that. Now, of course, when we start these episodes, there are so many different ways we can start. So I'm going to ask something of you that I'm going to guess. I'm, I'm taking a risk here that I think you can handle. If someone stops you on the street and they somehow know that you're involved in martial arts and they say, hey, tell me something about martial arts, what would you tell them? I tell them that martial arts can change your life for the positive, Uh, not just for the physical uh, 
exercise that one can get at it, but for mental health as well. Um, for those that, that do know me, um, I went through schooling and, and did my PhD, and I can honestly say that martial arts was a, was a massive part of that. Uh, I used it as a reward system, actually. So when I was studying Marshall, uh, when I was studying for exams, for example, my reward would be after, say, two hours, I'd go and do some katas or some self-defense mm. techniques. Then I'd go and study. And so there's just so many rewards, mental and physical, one can get at a martial arts. Now, there are a lot of people who love martial arts. I mean, we, we, we've got tons of them all over the world. They listen to this show. Hi, everyone. But not everyone's going to use solo training as a as a reward mechanism so th there are a number of things that we can take from from that what yeah, was it about what? training that gets you or or i i sh shouldn't restrict it to past tense what is it about training that you get so pumped about that it's a reward a lot of people would say you know after i do two hours of this rigorous academic studying i'm going to have a beer <laughs> or I'm going to eat candy or have a slice of pizza. Uh, I, you can probably see where, where my, my mind goes. My mind goes <laughs> to food rewards. Uh, but there are all kinds of things, you know, play a video game, whatever. What is it about martial arts that gets you so excited that it, it works as a reward for you? Yeah, I just love martial arts so much for the, for the physical exercise. And also, I just feel like it helps me reestablish my mind to be focused. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, if I've done two hours of intense studying and, you know, I feel a bit brain fried, fried from what I studied, nothing is better than taking, you know, the next 30 minutes or 40 minutes and going through my forms or my sets or my techniques or some weaponry and just re reconnecting my, my mind and body with what I need to be focused on. And it's like a, I use it as a reward system and I, and I, and I feel like, there's just so many benefits one can get from martial arts other than just learning how to defend oneself and learning how to potentially do what you have to do to, to protect yourself. I get it. Get it. Now, where did this journey start for you? How, how far how, how back in, in the origin story of you are we rewinding? Yeah, it started in 1985. And um, I was uh, 10 years old at the time. And uh, we have a, a, an event here in London, Ontario, Canada. It's a Western fair where they have everything from rides to displays to games. And, and, and usually at these, at these events back in the mid 80s, they had uh, martial arts demonstrations. They had a few that usually occurred every year. And, and I was very intrigued by one martial arts master, a karate master, who was doing things that I thought how is this possible? And, and at the time, I, I was really, really impressed by it where, you know, this individual would throw boards up in the air, punch them in the air, they'd break, he'd walk on nails, his display of weaponry was phenomenal. And I looked over at my dad and I, and I said to my, to my dad, I want to do this. And the very next night, I was enrolled in a Kenpo Karate school in London, Ontario. It was September 1985. And um, so the story goes from there. Oh, wow. And so the story goes, what was it, you said you were 10, which is a difficult age for a lot of people to start martial arts. You know, a lot of times you get somebody who starts at 10 and they're out at 12. They've bailed on martial arts for soccer, or basketball or baseball, whatever, some kind of team sport as they start to figure out who they are and their, their social hierarchy with their friends and everything. Was that you or did you just plow through and you've been a continuously training martial artist since? Well, there's a couple couple factors, one which is funny and one, one which is more serious. The, the, the funny was that I absolutely love the original Karate Kid movies, like to the point where <laughs> the original Karate Kid movie, uh, I basically have the thing memorized start to end and I still love it I, because I, I like the moral stories of them. You know, when people say to me, you know, have you seen such and such martial arts movie? And I'm, I'm like, look, if the acting's not good, you can't pay me to watch it. Like, but the Karate Kid movies, besides good acting, I thought have very strong moral stories. So, you know, I would go in my room and shut the door and pretend I was Daniel LaRusso. And, uh, but, but, but that comes to an end, one. you know, within a couple of years, like you said, Jeremy. And, you know, by the time, um, 
by the time I got to my green belt, and that was 1987, um, I found myself struggling to want to train all the time. And I remember, you know, telling my dad, I got a sore throat, stomach ache, you know, it's karate night. And, and something really weird happened in 1987 as a green belt. I won the grand championship in a martial arts tournament. So I won the forms, weapons, and the sparring division. And I don't have no idea how I won it because up to that point, um, I would lose a lot. <laughs> and uh, this is no fun, you know, getting beat up regularly and coming back for more punishment. Like, this is not, this is not the definition of intelligence here. But when I won that grand championship, I was like, oh, that was actually fun. I actually won that. I don't know how I did it. And then someone probably that you know came to our school, uh, Ma uh, Master Wally J. And Wally J, uh, who, who if you don't know, is a, um, a famous jujitsu expert. Mm. He came in and, and did a demonstration and a seminar on small circle jujitsu. And Wally J was an, an old individual at the time. And uh, I was just amazed by his skill yet humility that after that seminar, and this is, I tell my students this, I went home and I told my parents, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And it never, I never looked back after that point. Like, I'm really impressed. You know, you know, the thing is, is I'm less impressed by rank. Like it, it, nowadays, there are there are, there is commercialization of martial arts where people get rank, in my view, way, way too quickly. I'm impressed with skill and humility, like people who are confident, but humble, that don't have to tell everybody everything they've done in their life and, and make up fabricated stories to, to puff themselves up. I love the humility. So when I look at someone like Wally J. It was just so inspiring. I'm like, this this man with so little effort is making these people drop like flies mm -hmm. during this seminar, and he's so humble. and And I have the, a picture of Wally J in my garage right now, and it's and it was signed from that day of the seminar. And I look at it basically every time I train. Cool. You bring up a. I don't know if I necessarily want to call it a divisive topic, but a hot button topic in the martial arts, this, this idea of rank and skill and, and the correlation between the two. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think a lot of us fail to realize is the people that we hold up, the ones that we all tend to look at and, and, and think very highly of in the martial arts world, you know, very few of them ever talk about rank. Mm -hmm. You know, Bruce, I, I'm not aware of Bruce Lee ever going on record and saying, you know, like, I am this rank and, and doing all these things. And, and you talk about Wally J. And, and I've known a number of people who've talked about Wally J. None of them have ever told stories about the number of stripes on his belt or anything like that. And yet here we are in this in this environment. It's 2021. And we have a lot of people that lead with rank, that that is what you know, the, the story, the question that I asked you at the top of the episode, tell me something about martial arts. There are plenty of people who would start that answer with, well, I am, and I have been, and, and such and such. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with who brings us up, who raises us in the martial arts. So there's another question. How were you raised in the martial arts and how did that impact your views on, on this subject and others? Yeah, there. I mean, th there's three people. That, first of all, there, there's many, but there's three people that I would say really transformed my way of thinking. Uh, one is my former Arnis instructor, the late Grandmaster Remy Priestess, who I started training with in 1987. Um, he, he was a man who, you know, if you've ever seen any of his YouTube videos or trained with him, literally one of the fastest individuals I've ever seen, um, both empty handed with stick with knives, but such a gentle, humble man. Like it, it you never even know he was in martial arts. If you just kind of hung out with them outside of training with them. Um, the other individual is, is a guy named master Paul Chow, who I got my black belt with in Kung Fu and master Chow, um, just led by example. He was so anti, um, getting ranked quickly to the point where every one of his students that trained under him for a significant amount of time, they're all phenomenal. It's like, it's like good skill follows 
that mindset. And uh, so I'm really fortunate to have learned from from Master Paul Chow. And then and then in American Kempo, it would be um, my longtime mentor and teacher, Grandmaster Larry Tatum. And, and and Larry Tatum is 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 it's just unbelievable in the sense that I don't know what it is with him. As he gets older, he just gets better. <laughs> and I said to him one time, I said, you know, you know, away from seminar, and I said, what's the what's the what's the deal with you? And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, how is it that I have old VHS tapes from the 1980s of you moving? And here we are, you know, I think I asked him and this is about 2019. And you seem so faster now. And he said, well, Jamie, he was very humble about it. He said, it's, a, it's not true. It's not that I'm faster now. I just, my perceptual speed is better in the sense that I'm so trained and I practice so much that I'm able to see things and read things before they occur which almost gives the illusion that I'm faster. And I'm like, I'm so impressed. And, and, and this is why, you know, I never want to elevate myself because, geez, you know, some of the people that I mentioned, you know, Grandmaster Remy Priestess, Master Paul Chow, and, uh, and Grandmaster Larry Tatum, like, I, just, I, I just hope one day to be at that skill level when I'm older. They're, they're just so good. And mm-hmm. so that, I, I, I would just say, Jeremy, that, that, passion that they had for martial arts is so intoxicating and that like I can't get enough of it and here I am you know age 46 I'm probably more in love with martial arts now than when I got my first degree there's a word that we may not have heard here we are you're going to be episode 600 and something we (laughs) may not have heard this word in description of someone's passion for martial arts intoxicating you know it's a word that Outside of this context, if I just said, what do you think of when, you, when I use the word intoxicating? People are going to think about drugs and alcohol. Maybe they'll think of love and oxytocin and, and you know, feeling like they're overdosing on, on hormones. But in the context of martial arts, you know, it has a very different meaning. Would you say then that you are, here's another word that's often related to that word, addicted? Are you addicted to martial arts? totally addicted and and i'm not saying this please don't take this the wrong way i'm saying it (laughs) humbly the last time i missed a day of training was 2018 and and i and i and i'm not saying that to tap myself on the shoulder it's just it's just something i do every day and some will say well that's not good that's not healthy because you need to give your body time to rest maybe that's the case but i feel like if i take two or three days off I feel like, oh, it's harder to get back into it. So for me, the last day I missed a day of training was 2018. It's just, it's just like a daily routine. It's discipline, but I enjoy it. It's not like it's a, you know, sometimes when you go to work and you're like, oh, it's hard to get up and get ready and brush your teeth and get changed and get off to work. It's just something I love to do. And I just force it. I force it in. Even if I'm, I'm limited for time, when people say I have no time to train, I would be like, no, you don't have time not to train. If your schedule is that busy, you got to find a way to make it happen because it's good for your physical health. It's good for your mental health. It, it, it's good for your blood pressure. It's good for stress levels. It, it changes everything. And, and the other thing that I haven't really talked about, Jeremy, is that there's nothing more rewarding than seeing people improve their life because of martial arts through, through, through teaching. So, you know, I think of four kids in particular, I'm teaching right now in a group of four. And these kids have been with me, I think they're like three are green belt and one is um, a junior brown. They're in, our, they're in our separate kid system. But they've been with me for many years, at least five. And man, the, 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 to see these kids grow and be so excited to be at martial arts five years later, it's, that's intoxicating. Because I feel like it's like, Wow, you 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 really can change lives, and and that's what I that's what I love so much about martial arts. Mm. I'm I'm right there with you. When someone tells me they don't have time to train, instead of saying you don't have you don't have time not to train, my response is is a little more uh, confrontational, and it's you're just saying there are other things that are more important. Yeah, absolutely, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. But I I kind of I kind of want to go to the heart of of something that you just said about the consistency. 
when you follow the most successful people in the world at anything, whether we're we're talking success in financial terms or or any anything, doesn't matter. And, and there are so many books written about this. One of the things that you see come up time and time again is around discipline and building habits. Why is this show successful? Because we've built habits with it. Why are you successful as a martial artist? Because you've built habits. Anybody who's success, who is successful at anything has built a habit that led up to it. The, the idea of the, you know, you roll out of bed today and, and you're the best in the world at a thing or rich tomorrow, it doesn't exist. It happens in movies. That's not real life. And so I love the fact that you're, you're so open that sometimes you have to kind of force it to get it going because th there is a reality there. You know, we don't always feel like training, but you find the reward. Now you, I think you said 2018. Do you remember the last day you didn't train? <laughs> I don't actually remember that day, but I, but what, what, what it is, Jeremy is, is, um, uh, someone who I know very well, Master Sean Kelly said to me, you know, what's a really good idea, Jamie, is to log everything you do. I said, what do you mean? He said, it just like write down, you know, what forms you did, what techniques you did, what weapons you did, whatever it might be, how many times you sparred, how many times you rolled. And what that will do, it is, it is, a, it is not only motivate you to train more, but it'll let you see where you're missing certain areas that need to that need uh, attention. So I've been doing that, I don't know, since around 2012, ish around there. And, um, and because of that, it's so motivating, because I'm like, Oh, here's something I haven't touched in a while. So yeah. Right on, right on. When did you start teaching? And well, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up after that. Sure. Yeah. So I got my my black belt first degree in Kempo in uh, August of 1990. So 31 years ago, I got my black belt. And then I got my black belt in 1991 under uh, uh, Grandmaster Remy Priestess and, and our niece. I got my black belt in Black Dragon Kung Fu in 1994 under uh, Master Paul Chow. Those are my three main ranks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, American Kempo, Modern Arnese, and Black Dragon Kung Fu. And then and then, so I opened my school in August of 1995, and I've had my school ever since, although I teach it on a, quote, part-time basis, but I don't know what part-time means because it's pretty much every single day of the week I teach. Um, I'm a full-time professor day, <laughs> although it's been kind of nice as I've been on sabbatical for the last year, so I basically, I'm training almost morning to night and have tons of very committed students and so since 1995, I've opened my school. And then I should say that in 2012, January 2012, one of my um, uh, closest friends and one of a black belt under me, Matt Trejo, said, um, why don't we start Gracie Jiu-Jitsu? So I'm like, uh, you know, up to this point, it's very striking arts. Kempo is a striking art. Kung Fu is a striking art. Modern is a striking art. Yes, there's a little bit of grappling a little bit here and there, but not really. I know the lots say there's tons of grappling. You just got to know where to look. Well, <laughs> how many years experience do you know? Do you need do you need to know where to look? So I started Gracie Jiu Jitsu in January 2012, and it has been such an amazing experience because um, I think every high ranking black belt should lose and lose regularly. And I really mean that, Jeremy, because it's like it's so easy to puff yourself up. I'm such and such rank. Uh, you know, I, I've been training for this long. One thing about it, if you train in, in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or, or another Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu style, um, you know, whatever it might be, you're going to lose and you're going to lose a lot. So tapping and, you know, being arm barred and being choked, that's part of it. But it's so good for me because it's not that I'm, I'm using Jiu-Jitsu on its own. It helps me rethink many things that I do in American Kempo, which is my primary base art. Um, it makes me rethink, you know, the way I do a, a chokehold or what it really means to be caught because we get so in choreograph mode. Grab me here, I can get out. Grab me here, I can't. Sometimes you can't. If it's properly applied, <laughs> you know, unlike a, a dojo mode, you're going to sleep if it's properly applied. So jujitsu has been such a rewarding experience for me and and it, uh, it just reshapes a lot that I think. Mm, I get that.
Now you you opened your school young, if I'm doing my math right, 20? Exactly at 20. Yeah. That's, yeah. We, the, we've the, had a few people on. Is, Go ahead. No, I was just saying, the funny thing is, Jeremy, I had one goal and one goal only to get my quick undergraduate degree, which was a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology, and then get out and open my school. And the funny thing is, is two years later, so this would be like August 97, I'm like, okay, um, why do I have about 80 students, which is pretty good? And why, why am I, bare, why am I making so little? Well, rent is so high in a commercial spot. So back I go, I do my honors degree and master's degree, go back into the workforce, continue teaching part-time all the way through. And then I had this silly idea in 2008 to go back and do a PhD, but it, it worked really well for me. But I, I've continued my school all throughout. And, you know, when people are like, how, you know, how are you a professor at a university and, and do martial arts? Why do you go to the gym? You go to the gym because you want to work out because it's good for your physical, mental health. This is just what I do. Martial arts is my life. Right on. Yeah. Now, I, I want to go back. I, I want to unpack that statement of high-ranking instructors need to learn learn to lose. You know, you, you, you talked about starting BJJ. This is something that comes up. You know, we, we talk about it on this show, and, and, and this is not my term, but we talk about it as the white belt mentality, this idea that there's always more to learn. You can start over. There's a lot of benefit there. And without, you know, going deeper in your credentials, I, I've got some things on here that if you want to share, I'll, I'll let you share them. I'm not going to. But starting over, uh, based on where you've taken your martial arts training, is not something very many people are going to do especially in art that is so dramatically different and one that for anybody who has done any Brazilian jiu-jitsu knows that you really spend first, what, three, six, 12 more months just getting the crud kicked out of you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> talk talk, yeah, talk and, about and, that and, if you would. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, uh, I respect anyone who's devoted their life to martial arts and has, you know, has impacted others and has achieved a high rank. But, but I disagree with with a lot of um, other high ranking Kempo black belts on one thing, and that is um, the idea that, uh, well, you know, uh, you don't. Striking is all you need. You know, if you look at the early UFC, it's very, it's very sportive. I'd go, is it though? Yes. Now we're in rounds and time limits. Those early UFCs were not sportive. There was no rules. You couldn't bite. You couldn't eye gouge. And by the way, if you did, you didn't lose. You didn't lose. You got a warning. I mean, how much more raw can you get? So I, I, I feel like Jeremy, uh, yes. Yeah, you know whether certain fights were kind of picked but but the, the, you know someone like hoist grace who came back and fought you know three times in one night um like you have to understand like a lot of these striking arts had a mindset that oh, i'm just gonna knock the smaller guy out but what happened was you know hoist really exposed the world to the idea that the two safest spots to be in a fight are far away or, or skin tight. So if you if the person can't hit you because the range is such where you're outside of the range, you're safe. Then when he ties you up and clinches you, takes away their punches, takes away their kicks, takes away their knees, takes away their elbows, down they go. He, he'd take it on top of you, mount, guard, whatever, uh, triangle choke, whatever. So I, I feel like as a, as a martial artist who truly tries to make oneself better and my students better, how can I ignore that? How can I adopt uh, possibly a mindset, and, and I'm going to be really frank here, of a lot of not just American Kempo experts, but other striking arts going, ah, I dismiss it. All that stuff is, all that stuff is just sport. Really? I mean, it, 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 seemed, it, it, it seemed like a lot of these striking experts couldn't do a whole lot. Now, I'm not advocating the best spot to be on the, on the, in a street fight on the ground, certainly in multiple attack situations. Of course not. But... I, 
to, to think that if you're taken to the ground and you've learned all these stand up skills and striking skills and it didn't work, it didn't work at what it was meant to, <laughs> to outstrike someone to, to, and then you get away, you got taken to the ground. All of a sudden it's going to work on the ground. I don't believe it. I don't believe it because I don't believe that if you're not good enough to win the fight, stand up that you all of a sudden you're good on the ground when they've taken you there, you better have some, you better have some skills. Mm. So it was very humbling, but so good for my martial arts journey to go, wow, <laughs> I guess my Kempo wasn't working too great on the ground. It was great for me. It was great for my students. Now, now I say this as someone who I, I, I don't hold a black belt rank in Kempo, but I do hold rank in Kempo and I, and I respect the art tremendously. The idea that that we would say adding some diversity, some range diversity to our skill set is irrelevant and a waste of time coming from an art that espouses a tremendous diversity of hand striking techniques. You don't need 42 ways to strike someone in the face. And yet, and, and, and I'm saying that with, with a little bit, meaning a little bit of humor there, to, to say one makes sense and the other doesn't seems a little contradictory to me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I completely agree. And, and the other, the other thing that really shocked me, Jeremy, about Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which I had no idea about until I started training it is the misconception that Gracie Jiu Jitsu is an art that only fights on the ground. And, and I, I have to say this, I, I know more stand-up techniques in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu than I know in Kempo. Oh, and that includes all the extensions up to the end of the green extensions. But but people don't think that. They think, oh, it's just, you know, how to escape the mount, how to do an Americana arm lock, how to do an arm bar, how to do a triangle choke, Kimura. Nope. I, I've learned more stand-up techniques in Gracie than I have learned in American Kempo. And I'm not slamming Kempo. I'm just saying that it's easy to criticize a martial art. But if you've never taken a single lesson, I, I have to say, the opinion matters less. And I'm all for opinions. And I'm, and I'm trying to say this in a humble way. I think opinions are, are, are great. That's how we generate new ideas, theories, hypotheses, you name it. But in fairness, know something about the topic, not just what others have said before you go and slam it. I agree. Now, when we talk about people, and let's broaden this out, you know, it's not just Kempo practitioners who will criticize things. There are people from all over the world training in all variety of martial arts who are so committed to their art that they will go through these mental gymnastics, or maybe not necessarily mental gymnastics. They are so committed that they will denigrate and exclude training in other things because they think what they do is all they need. How many of them do you think genuinely believe that? And how many of them are jumping through some, some mental hoops and trying to justify it to themselves? Great question and tough answer. So I, I, feel like, I feel like there are a large proportion of people who have got their mindset, my martial art is superior. But I also feel that there's also a, a, a good percentage of people that go and watch people from different martial arts and go, oh. but it, it means having to rechange things in one's life. It means that if you're in a martial art, and I'm not going to name a martial art, but if you're in a martial art that maybe is much more in the sort of realm, realm and you're trying to focus and, you, and your passion is how to defend oneself in a street situation, because I'm, I'm very self-defense to me. You know, when someone comes into my school, they're not coming and going, hi, can you teach me how to win at the next tournament? And, 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 and I'm not being negative towards tournaments because, you know, I, I certainly used to compete a lot more to challenge myself than anything. But I believe that, that people come in to learn self-defense. So I do think there's a large proportion of people that are recognizing, yeah, there's more stuff out there. But if you're a, a high-ranked black belt, and I'm going to be really frank, and you've almost have an a, a, a appearance or an aura to your students and others really, really high. It is hard. It's humbling to have to go, you know, um, 
to make significant changes, I have to learn something else. And, and that's why I don't discredit. I don't discredit martial arts until I've trained in it. Like, like I, the other thing is, 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 is criti- you know, critical analysis and criticizing traditional arts. And, and it, man, they, they could hit. So to, to, to that, you know, because my art is more, you know, quote, modern, and we can talk about whatever that means because it can mean a variety of things to different people, you know, sometimes it really comes down to how hard are you training? It's like when people go, you know, I train under so-and-so. So that means that my lineage is better than your lineage. It doesn't mean a whole lot if you're not training a lot. Great, you learn under that person, but how often do you train? Mm. Would, would you rather have a very reliable, high-quality firearm with one round in the magazine or a lower quality one with a full magazine. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly what I was getting at, Jeremy. I get it. I get it. Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit here. You've had the chance. I mean, the the names that you mentioned, I'm I'm not going to speculate which of, which of those names is more well known to the people that are listening. You know, I'm familiar with all three of these individuals and pretty phenomenal that you've had the opportunity to, to grow up in the martial arts with all three of them. I mean, I don't want to say luck, uh, but fortunate. I mean, absolutely amazing. If you were to kind of do an autopsy on you as a martial artist and carve pieces off and say, you know, this came from this person and this came from this person, What's the most substantial part of who you are as a martial artist that can be attributed to each of them individually? Oh, yeah, I could do that for sure. Um, so well, let me start with uh, Grandmaster Tatum. Um, in 2000, and to make sure I get my year right here, 2004, I think it was 2004, it might have been 2005, no, 2004, uh, I got my sixth degree black belt from Larry Tatum. And it was it was interesting because uh, that was the first rank that I got through um, Grandmaster Tatum. I got my sixth, seventh, and eighth from him. But my first rank under him was a sixth degree. And um, he said something. He'll totally forget this, but I'm sure he'll listen and go, ah, oh, now I remember. He said something to me that was so groundbreaking. First of all, he gave me really, really good feedback, which meant a lot coming from him. But... In fairness, I'm kind of like, okay, great, I got it. But where do I go from here? How do I improve? Because no one's perfect at, at, at any test. The whole idea, you have to be perfect at your test. This is my opinion, or you fail. Come on. To me, making mistakes is part of our growth. And he said something that changed my whole martial arts journey in 2004. He said, Jamie, it's really obvious that you've watched all of my D- DVDs <laughs> because you had the movements like I was moving almost exact for every technique. And he said, while I appreciate your movement and how well you did, you, you moved, stop trying to move like me and move like yourself. Put your own signature on Kempo. And it was like, no, 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 don't worry about lie. Shackle off. Because, like, I always tried to um, to move like Tatum because I, I looked at him and his skill level and how he moved as the epitome of this is how I want to move. And he says, okay, <laughs> we're not the same height. We're not the same weight. You're built different than me. And you need to move like yourself. And from that point forward, it was like, pressure came off me every time I trained with him and, and tested. There was no pressure. It was more just, can I perform at the level that I know I'm capable of without having the pressure of trying to move like Master Tatum? Because I can't move like Master Tatum. I was trying. So that was what I'd say for Larry Tatum. Um, the other interesting thing he said to me that, that again, he probably won't remember, but I, I said, how do you see everything in your techniques? You're like, oh, if he does this, or if he does this, I do this, I do this. And he said, well, in Kempo, we often try to do the same choreographed moves over and over and over. But there comes a point where 
that can only take you so far. He said, you need to think always of the perspective of the attacker. And when you take that attacker's perspective, you learn how to create on your own. So I'm like, yeah, that's basic, but that is so true. So when I'm working with my black belts, I'll say, hey, what else could you do? What else could you do? And, and it allows me the freedom to not be bound by techniques, kind of like a Bruce Lee thing, but actually be able to pick and choose at any time what I feel is most appropriate given the circumstance. So that's Tatum. Um, um, Master Paul Chow, Master Paul Chow is one of the best fighters I've ever seen. Uh, he's a, a ninth degree black belt in black dragon kung fu and trained under his dad, runs a successful school, Northern Black Dragon Martial Arts. Um, besides, I think what he did is he taught me more gracefulness. So stop moving like a robot, let your body flow. And, and he got me, I'll be honest, very good at sparring because we fought and we fought a lot and it was very humbling. And he really, really pushed in me that as you continue to move up in rank, it is very common, sometimes more common than not that you never see the head instructor ever spar, ever, yep. you know, so they, they'll demonstrate their techniques. You know, this is how I view it, Jeremy. It's easy to look good when it's choreographed, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the reality is I spar with all my black belts. I get, I get caught. I get hit in the head. I get, a, I get, a, you, you mean you're not perfect? You, <laughs> you can, you can <laughs> hold high rank and be an instructor without being perfect. Well, that's what I'm getting at. And, and it's and it's humbling, like it's humbling to take a uh, we we fight with control with high technique because we want to we want to we want to train till we're in our nineties. But it's humbling to to eat a nice sidekick once in a while and not have that that I actually think it's 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 easier for me than to put myself on a on a pedestal where they view me like I'm I'm at a whole different realm of life than them. Like that's that's ridiculous. So I go out there and I spar and, and, and I think Paul Chow is probably getting close to age 70 and still spars. Like that's unbelievable. And, you know, he's fighting 20 year old, 25 year old black belt. So he, he inspired me that way. And then Grandmaster Remy Priestess, um, one of the nicest guys I, I've ever met. He, um, he really taught me that, um, uh, to, uh, not only how to, how to, how to be good with sticks and knives, but, really to uh, to flow. So yes, we have weapons in Kempo. And I know some will say, well, Kempo was also a weapons-based system. I don't agree. I think it's an empty hand-based system. When I look at the Ed Parker's Kempo Creed, it says, I come to you with only karate, my empty hands, not my weapons. And then it says, I have no weapons. So Kempo is an empty hand system, which also uses a little bit of weapons. But I believe to be good in weapons, you need to learn a weapons-based system. That's my personal opinion. And, and, and Remy taught me that. And, and more important, he just taught me to um, that not to be bound. That, you know, so all the, the, the stick and knife, knife drills is not to be bound by a specific movement, but just to flow. So it's kind of like, um, I heard a story and I'm just like, oh my gosh, that is so inspiring. I heard a story of someone who trained um, under Danny Anasanto. And this is how I think too. And Danny Anasanto was teaching a really cool, I believe it was double knife drill. And the, the person said to me, I loved it so much. And I said to, to Danny, I said, um, we haven't done that drill forever. And Danny said something to him. And he, of course he told me and he said, that's because I don't want you to be bound by movement. <laughs> Whoa. Mm. <laughs> Whereas our mindset is how many repetitions can I get in this? And then how often does my instructor review that? And, and, and I understand that way of thinking too, but I love that Danny Asano approach. Don't be bound by movement. Learn something and then we're going to go back to it and, and just to have be more free flowing, almost like a Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do philosophy. And that's really what Remy taught me. And, and the other thing I remember, too, about Remy would be every time he thought you were good with knives, like everyone says, you know, I'm a I'm an expert with knives. <laughs> Remy would put like, you know, things like like lipstick on on rubber knives and your shirt's like completely red. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I'm not as good as I thought. 
but but that but that's a good thing because it makes you sure. more serious about when you work with knives and not to have this illusion that you're some expert at disarming knives with your b- blindfolded. Hmm. Yeah, so I all did. three were such were just so inspirational to me, and and same with you know I, the, the other person that I think has really helped me too is is um, Master Sean Kelly, who who, who really taught me um, to to not be flat footed. So we see a lot of what we call in, in Kempo, you know, a neutral bow. And we, we, we finish moves in a neutral bow, but you know, with an elbow or with a, a, any type of a strike, we're not really feet, what we call facing our work. We don't have a bracing angle when we're striking. So I don't know, I'm do a classic technique, five swords. And I finish with that downward hand sword and I'm flat footed. The reality is if that person pushes me I'm off balance, but it works great in demos. Demos will never fail you. This is what I argue. Demos will always work. They'll never fail you. Um, but on a real opponent, if you're not, if you don't have a bracing angle, if you're not facing your work, you're not generating the same power, and um, you're not, in my opinion, executing tempo like you can. So Sean Kelly, you know, who who trained under, you know, Ed Parker, uh, Hawk Planus. Um, Grandmaster Mike Pick really taught me the importance of having um, that back foot up when I'm doing my tempo, and it's changed the way I move. I can see that. Yeah. Now, now we've we've touched on this subject a couple times, maybe even three times in our conversation today, and it's this idea of whether you want to call it reality or pressure testing or how the real world works, and it's something that martial artists get really wrapped around the axle on, on, on in, in a variety of ways. Some will devote all of their training to things that, that they think are reality-based. And if it doesn't have, you know, a 99% correlation to what would happen in real life, it's useless training. And then you've got other people who will defend other things. And, and, and really, we again, we, we argue about this, but it sounds like this is something that you have some balance with it. Some of the things that you're training, you are aware of this correlation with reality. Am, am I am I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I, I've done training uh, um, who, who's trained, helped train uh, Ronda Rousey, for example, on the UFC. Mm-hmm. I, I've been, I've trained uh, with Hoist Gracie and, and, and they at seminars and they'll say the same thing. Okay. Um, I, I, I find Henner really is this way. Henner Gracie, he'll say, okay, this is street. This is more for those who go into sportive realm. And sometimes it's you, you know, people want to compete JJ, for example, but it's completely different because in a BJJ tournament, you know, you can be at the bottom of the garden, be good to go. There's nothing not doing anything to you really to, to, to try to submit you. But the person's getting points or mounted you and you're fine on the bottom. It, you're, you're escaping all of their mount submissions, but they're accumulating points because they're mount. That's sport. Whereas, um, whereas the differentiation is for what Heather will say is, okay, now that we're now in the street realm. So in the street realm, things like matters, understanding distance management. Henry Gracie said, one of the seminars, he said, it was unbelievable. He said, and this is not something that's normally taught. I bet a lot of BJJ schools. He said, if you're in a BJJ school, one hour class, and the word punch doesn't come up, run for the door. Because the focus is on sports, uh, on sport. The reality is, to you in a real fight, they don't just come up and, and gently grab a hold of your gi and try to uh, get a takedown and then mount. People try to hit you, so you always have to be aware of punch protection and distance management. And then Hoist would say, um, if 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 something doesn't work on the street, I refuse to teach it. Hmm. So it's just different mindset. I love, I understand both. I, I mean, I understand both, but I, I try to do things more that are reality based. Now I know, like, for example, I love the saber. I know I'm not going to walk around 
let it carry out with the saber. But but I feel like things like weapons really help, you know, my footwork, um, coordination, which which in turn helps things like sparring and your forms and your techniques, et cetera. And I'm right there with you, you know, to, to go back to a firearm analogy, uh, soldiers don't only train by shooting people. Yeah. Right? There's, there, there's room for drills. There's room for unpacking and work, working certain things. There are, there's value in training that isn't always complete. You know, you, you can, you can take the footwork from doing this form or you can take the, you know, the strength building aspect of doing something in this way and, 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 piecemeal together because martial arts training is well for to me and it sounds like to you and and i believe to most people it's about more than learning how to fight absolutely absolutely and and that's too is like you know when when, if someone finds people i'm talking about because i'm around telling everyone i'm in martial arts but if someone says to me and they hear i'm in martial arts how many fights have been in zero yeah Zero. How? Um, I, I, I try to avoid. Like, I, I've been a lot of contact fights, that's for sure, in the street. So, and it's like, when I hear a black belt go, yeah, I'm teaching a seminar. I've been in well over 20 fights and I've won them all. I'm just going to be honest, Jeremy. Where are you going? <laughs> like, who hanging out with to be in this many fights? Do you know what I mean? Like, 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 um, one of my one of the demography professors, I was an undergrad at the time, uh, said, um, was talking about this the boom bust and echo by David Foot, and he and, and and he said something like, you know, apparently boom echo theory can explain two thirds of everything. <laughs> so a student goes two thirds of everything. How do you explain that? And he said, well. You know, if you look at it, for example, events and times events stronger lifted. So where you're going, if you're in an environment where you're consistently going out, for example, where there's heavy drinking, you know, the odds of violence increase. If you're in, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people get into substance use. The odds of violence increases and people to improve their mental health. Ultimately, it leads to worse mental health. So where you go matters. I, you know, I'm I'm happy to stay put with at home with my wife Chantel, and when I'm not with her, I'm usually training. So it's kind of like you know where you choose to go matters as well. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a there's a line not from the Karate Kid movie that that you and I love, but from the next Karate Kid, and you know, many of us will. We'll remember this one, fighting not good. Absolutely. But if must yep. fight, win. Right, Mr. Miyagi. Yep. And now, 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 by the way, Jeremy, I have to tell you, I'm just, <laughs> maybe I'm old school. I'm just loving the, the Cobra Kai series. <laughs> yeah, it's so good, isn't it? I can't get, it's so good. It, it's so it, awesome. I can't get my magic to it. it. <laughs> she won't watch it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's okay. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's. Hard. I love it because it, it brings back my eighties. Exactly. Memories. Yeah, we're we're. You, you've got just a couple of years on me, but we're roughly the same age. Started training at roughly the same time, and I think you and I and and many others who started martial arts in the eighties, you know, we're the perfect person to watch that show. It's like it was custom made for us. And it I remember was. watching. I think they were thinking about Jeremy and Jamie. When they I think they, they were. Did. I think they were. And actually, we had John Hurwitz, <laughs> uh, one of the writers on the show, and. And, uh, and he, he didn't say that it was written for us, which was really sad. Um, you know, he did, he didn't identify us. We're not in the credits, which is kind of a bummer, but, uh, we, we can, we can still believe it. Maybe they just didn't want to admit it publicly. I've chatted a little bit with, um, Daryl Vidal Mm. on, on, on on Twitter. Good guy. I didn't really know him very well. I know from the Karate Kid, the original, but good guy super humble i've watched some of his youtube uh phenomenal martial artists and the cool thing about him is i'm like wow same martial arts not american kempo granted yeah. but kempo and filipino martial arts so really cool guy fingers crossed he's coming back 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, really cool guy. We we had the pleasure of talking to him on episode five hundred eight. Yep, he came on. Yeah, it, it's it, it is it is amazing to see that that return, that kind of full circle. Uh, there was a wonderful podcast I, I listened to, not a martial arts podcast, but WTF with Mark Maron, and he had Billy Zabka on, and they got to talk about this really long arc of his life. And I think it's it's really interesting to look at both Zabka and, and Machio and what they did before and after the Karate Kid films and how really you you can almost track their careers to this inevitable moment where they they come back together to do this show it's almost unavoidable if you look at their their trajectories yeah i think they have such a good job at recreating the story i love what they've done with johnny slash with um amazing amazing story and now i'm hearing uh good old terry silver's coming back which makes it even more exciting can't wait yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 a great it's a great show are you seeing any kind of an impact in your school from the series is that is that doing anything for you no not really it's i'm finding jeremy it's it's uh, it's those like us that have been around in the eighties for the originals that are really, really, really loving it. And, yeah. um, uh, many of my black belts who've been with me a long, long time. We talk about it outside of, uh, our training hours, of course. So, uh, but I'm, I, I just, it's, it's something I look forward to. I don't watch a lot of shows to be honest. I, I, um, I watch a lot of sports and, uh, so it is one of the, the few shows I really, really, really enjoy. Nice. Nice. What sports do you watch? I'm a diehard. Well, this is embarrassing to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm a diehard Toronto Maple Leafs fan. They break my heart every year. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm a die. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm a diehard Cleveland Browns fan. Now they're looking really good. So those are, and of course, I watch a lot of uh, UFC as well. Sure. sure. My, I had the my... opportunity to learn da- to meet Daniel Cormier. That was a good. Oh, experience. cool. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Was, how was he? Was he a nice guy? Oh my gosh! Yeah, we 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 went or we our family went down uh, to Vegas, and it was uh, four days before he fought John Jones for his first fight. Mm. And it's the funniest story. We're in the MGM Grand. We had some time to kill before we go back to the airport. So at the far end of the MGM Grand, and the elevator opens up, and who is it? Daniel Cormier. So he he you know le- opens the um, the elevator door and says, "Hey, are you coming on?" And I'm thinking, like, this is weird, Jeremy. I'm not making this up. He, he's always been my favorite fighter oh, of all wow. of them. Just because I love his his down-to-earth, uh, you know, and, and how great of a fighter is. So I said, no, we're not coming on, but you're getting off. <laughs> and he goes, pardon? I go, I really need you, Daniel, to come off this elevator to come meet my family. And he laughed, and he came out. And did his pictures with my daughters and with oh, me. He was awesome. so down to earth and so easy to talk to. Great guy. Yeah. And there's another example. Someone who has taken things so far. They don't hide behind the trappings of success and fame. They recognize the, the, the value of what they have. And that others gave it to them. That they, they hold that oh, position absolutely. because exactly. of others. And willing to engage. And that's one of the things that I've learned in, in having this show. When we finally, if we're talking about somebody who's, you know, a, a big name, if we can get to them, they say yes. Absolutely. It's the people yeah. who think they're a bigger deal than they are that say no. <laughs> Those are the ones that say no. It's like, okay, completely that's agree. fine. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Well, this this has been great. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, see what you got going on, website, social media, email, anything like that you're willing to share? Yeah, absolutely. My email is uh, very easy. It's jamiesebrook at live.ca. So J-A-M-I-E-S-E-A-B-R-O-O-K at live.ca. If you type in Jamie Seabrook on Google, you can find a bunch of things and 
Uh, I also have a Facebook martial arts page, so they can uh, find me there. And I also have a YouTube channel. So if they just if you just type in Jamie Seabrook on YouTube, um, I'm constantly posting videos. I do it all free of charge, and I just um, I, I love love to give back. So I, it's something that I thoroughly enjoy. And my daughters, my daughters that film me always get a, a gift card for, for filming. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, this this has been great. This has been a lot of fun. I, I I appreciate that you were willing to go to some lesser discussed topics with me. That's always one of my favorite things. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming on. And you know, this is where we we wind down. I'm going to record an outro. But what are your last words to the audience? I just want to say thanks so much, Jeremy, for having me on on the show. It's truly been a pleasure. And uh, you know, I just say for anyone. Um, you know, if if you if you used to train and you stopped, you can always pick yourself back up. So, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, I trained a long time ago. I just can't get back." Sure, you can. Martial arts is for anyone of any age, and uh, um, you can you can use it to make yourself better physically, mentally. And when you're better physically and mentally, so will those around you because that 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 will transpire and and, and inspire, I should say, others uh, around you. I told you that was a great conversation and I want to thank you for listening to it. I want to thank Dr. Jamie for coming on and having such a good conversation with me. It was fun. You know, I, I still can't get over there. There are episodes that this really comes through for me. And this was one of them where I kind of take a step back and I'm like, you know, th this, is this really part of my job? Do I really get to do this and call it work? I, I'm so lucky. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for your kindness, your generosity, your openness. Thanks for the great conversation, and I, and I do hope we get to talk again soon. Now you, the listener, thanks for sticking around. I'm going to give you a couple things that I think are really important for you to know, so hopefully you'll listen to the next 90 seconds of my voice. First off, if you want to go deeper on this episode, please go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and check out episode 626. We'll get the transcript, we'll get the photos and the videos and the links and all the stuff that we do for this and the other episodes. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. If you want to support us, here are a couple things you can do. Send this or another episode, your favorite episode, to somebody who hasn't checked out the show yet. Tell them why you want them to listen to it, and then hopefully they will. If you want to get faster, go to whistlekickprograms.com. Check out the speed development program. It is unreal. You will get faster, faster than you've ever thought possible. Seriously, if you don't, if you do it and you don't, I'll give you your money back. Just plain, plain and simple. You can also support our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. If you go to Patreon, if you contribute to the Patreon, we give you exclusive content you don't see anywhere else. If you love the show, you can probably find two, five, maybe even 10 bucks a month to get extra bonus stuff, including now free merch. So check that out. Now, if you've got feedback, guest suggestions, something like that, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>